Hi, everybody. I'm Lyndon Luck, Assistant Professor of Radiology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. And uh, today's topic is solid and cystic pancreatic lesions. Here's a lecture overview. Uh, I'll be talking about a number of different pathologies today, uh, including pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma with important concepts, a neuroendocrine tumor, serious cystadenoma, mucinous cystic neoplasm, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, uh, and a couple of tricky cases at the end of the lecture. Here is case one. It's a patient with epigastric pain and jaundice. And here we have a video clip of a coronal post-contrast CT. Take a look. Okay, many of you have seen something like this before. Uh, you know this as a classic example of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, or PDAC. We see these mostly in elderly patients. There are a number of risk factors for PDAC, uh, including smoking, family history, obesity, and chronic pancreatitis. Uh, patients will often present with uh, a number of vague symptoms, including uh, epigastric pain, pain radiating into the back, uh, gnawing upper abdominal pain. Uh, generally, just pain is the most common symptoms patients will have. Uh, some patients will have jaundice and pruritus, uh, and others will have secondary diabetes. Now, most cases of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma are unresectable at the time of initial discovery and diagnosis, uh, mostly because of two things. Uh, either the lesion uh, has uh, become locally advanced, meaning that uh, the surrounding vasculature in the upper abdomen uh, is too involved with the tumor, and so it's unable to be resected. Uh, and uh, there's also a presence of uh, distal metastases. On CT, the lesion is classically hypoattenuating on non-contrast images uh, and poorly, poorly enhancing on post-contrast images. The mass itself is often ill-defined uh, and hard to uh, evaluate the exact boundaries of the tumor. Uh, this is secondary to the tumor itself becoming blended in with the adjacent parenchyma, uh, as well as surrounding desmoplastic changes. Uh, on MR imaging, the mass is usually T1 hypo-intense, uh, with variable signal on T2-weighted images. Uh, but like CT, uh, when you give the patients IV contrast, the uh, mass will become hypo-enhancing in comparison to the adjacent pancreatic parenchyma. Uh, some lesions, uh, namely those in the pancreatic head and unsinate process, will have uh, pancreatic and biliary ductal dilation, the classic uh, quote-unquote double duct sign. Uh, and again, this lesion often involves the surrounding vasculature, and so evaluating these lesions is very uh, can be very tricky because you have to evaluate the vessels one by one, uh, to make sure you're describing them adequately for our clinicians and surgeons. Here are a number of uh, example MRI images. MRCP image here in the top left shows the double duct sign. You've got a diffusely dilated common bile duct and a diffusely dilated main pancreatic duct. Now on the top right, you've got diffusely increased signal here within the pancreatic head tumor uh, with concurrent low signal on ADC images in the bottom right. Uh, and on the bottom left image, on the post-contrast images, you have very vague heterogeneous enhancement of the pancreatic head, but overall hypoattenuating compared to the adjacent parenchyma. Now, there are a set of imaging guidelines that we do follow, uh, not only to uh, be kept up on the most recent version of, uh, of guidelines in terms of how to treat and, uh, and manage these lesions, both uh, pre- and post-resection, uh, uh, but also on how to report these lesions. Uh, the NCCN guidelines, the most recent edition released in February 2018, uh, draws heavily upon a consensus statement on a PDAC radiology reporting template uh, that was published in uh, radiology in uh, 2014. Uh, and this really describes a template for uniform, comprehensive, and reproducible reporting of imaging findings. Uh, what this does is that it standardizes our language and it allows uh, radiologists, regardless of practice type, to really communicate more clearly with our surgeons to dictate patient management. And so uh, take a look at these uh, two papers, these two resources, uh, for further information. Here's a sample case using this uh, reporting template uh, in a patient with 
a uh, tumor in the pancreatic head and neck uh, contacting the superior mesenteric vein. There's approximately 180 degree tumor abutment uh, with the SMV. Now, there's also a focal contour irregularity. If you look at the uh, colored portion of the vein, which I colored here in red, you'll see that the contour that's contacting the tumor is a little more flattened in comparison to the portion of the vein that is not. Uh, and so uh, in places that use a drop-down menu, all you do is select the salient features and the report sort of populates uh, all of these findings for our clinicians to follow. You really want to know your lingo and uh, understand your vocabulary uh, when describing pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma vascular tumor involvement. Uh, there's a very certain set of words that uh, we use or that the radiologists should use uh, when uh, describing tumor contact. Uh, it allows our surgeons, again, to understand uh, whether or not that they're able to uh, attempt resection or to resect these lesions. Uh, the term abutment is used to describe tumor contact with the vessel of 180 degrees or less. The term encasement is used to describe greater than 180 degree tumor contact with the vessel. And the term deformity is used to describe uh, any irregularity in a normal vessel contour, uh, regardless of the degree of tumor contact. So in cases with deformity, the tumor can have less than or greater than 180 degrees of contact. Uh, as long as the vessel shape itself is altered, uh, we, we describe it as a deformity. Here's a very long table from the uh, recent NCCN guidelines describing the three main categories in terms of resectability status, uh, resectable, borderline resectable, and unresectable. Uh, in the absence of pancreatic metastases, our primary job is really to report salient and pertinent vascular and primary tumor findings that allow surgeons to come to a clinical choice. Uh, you know, just because a patient will qualify as borderline resectable, according to the guidelines, uh, will mean the surgeon will automatically perform the surgery. You know, when you're describing these lesions, you really want to um, be as accurate as possible in order to let the surgeons um, figure out a plan. Here's case two, patient with pain and hypoglycemia. We've got uh, axial and coronal post-contrast images. On your right, you've got uh, focal uh, radio tracer uptake in the pancreatic head on a 111 indium pentatriotide scan. Now this is, of course, a classic appearance of a neuroendocrine tumor. Now these are rare lesions. They make up one to 2% of your overall pancreas tumors. Uh, neuroendocrine tumors are seen in various syndromes. Uh, the two most commonly uh, associated syndromes with neuroendocrine tumor are von Hippel-Lindau disease and tuberous sclerosis. Uh, insulinoma is the most common neuroendocrine tumor, uh, which is why this patient here in this vignette had hypoglycemia. Now, a big difference between neuroendocrine tumors and pancreatic ductal adenocarcinomas is that neuroendocrine tumors are classically hypervascular on post-contrast images. Uh, and so these lesions demonstrate peak enhancement in the early arterial phase, uh, which is obtained 25 to 35 seconds post-contrast administration, uh, whereas PDACs are going to be hypo-enhancing. Uh, most of these lesions are radio tracer sensitive with 111 indium triotide studies. Approximately 80% of these lesions do show uh, avidity. Uh, and overall, these lesions have a better outcome compared to uh, ductal adenocarcinoma. Moving on, here's case three. A patient for a malignancy workup. On the top, you see CT and MRI axial post-contrast images uh, showing a focal lesion in the posterior distal pancreatic body and tail. Uh, on the bottom, you've got axial T2 weighted images uh, and a coronal MRCP. And uh, this is an example of a serous cystadenoma. Uh, for those who have heard the term grandmother, mother, daughter lesion, uh, this is the classic grandmother lesion, uh, named so because most of the patients you see this lesion in uh, are elderly 
over 60 years old. Uh, and most of our patients with serious adenoma you see are female, about a four to one ratio. Now, the pancreatic head is the most common location of this lesion, uh, even though this example shows a serious cystadenoma in the pancreatic tail. Uh, these are benign lesions. And so oftentimes the, uh, the clinicians and surgeons will you know, obtain follow-up studies mainly to assess for growth uh, and stability of the lesion. Uh, there are cases in which the serious cystadenoma can grow uh, quite large, uh, and displace other structures or, or even cause obstruction and pain. Uh, and so once those symptoms uh, develop, uh, oftentimes these lesions are uh, resected to relieve those symptoms. Uh, there's no recurrence uh, once the lesion is resected, and basically there's no malignant potential. There are some anecdotal reports of cystadenocarcinomas arising from a serious cystadenoma, uh, but by, by and large we treat these as uh, benign lesions. Serious cystadenomas appear as lobulated multicystic masses. They have a quote-unquote bunch of grapes appearance, uh, and usually the cysts are greater than 2 centimeters in size, and uh, there's multiple cysts within a single lesion, often more than six in number. Uh, there are examples of serious cystadenomas where the cysts are, are very small, uh, oftentimes so small and packed together that they may mimic even a solid lesion. And so just because uh, it doesn't have the quote-unquote bunch of grapes appearance with large cysts doesn't mean it's not necessarily a serious cystadenoma. Uh, these lesions have a central enhancing stellate scar and central calcifications. There is no ductal communication between serious cystadenoma uh, and the adjacent main pancreatic duct. On MRI, serious cystadenomas manifest with T2 hypointense scars as well as T2 hyperintense cystic components. Just to real illustrate a point that I made prior, serious cystadenomas can grow quite large and cause symptoms. Uh, this is a patient who had been followed for several years with a serious cystadenoma. It slowly grew in size uh, to, uh, to become quite large here in the right mid-abdomen. This is a pancreatic head serious cystadenoma. You can see coarse calcifications here on the axial and coronal post-contrast images. Uh, this patient developed uh, chronic abdominal pain and symptoms, and eventually the surgeons treated this by performing a Whipple procedure, uh, and the patient did quite well. Case four, uh, we've got a patient presenting with bloating, and we've got uh, post-contrast axial CT here on your left, and on the right you have a T2-weighted image. Uh, showing a focal mass uh, in the uh, pancreatic body and tail. And this is an example of a mucinous cystic neoplasm. It is the mother lesion in the grandmother, mother, daughter uh, lesion um, discussion. Uh, the vast majority of the cases of mucinous cystic neoplasms are seen in middle-aged women. Uh, they're most commonly seen in the pancreatic body and tail unlike serious cystadenomas, which are seen mostly in the pancreatic head. Uh, and also unlike serious cystadenomas, mucinous cystic neoplasms are considered pre-malignant lesions. Uh, patients will often have elevated CEA and CA199, uh, which are tumor markers. Uh, and so the definitive treatment for these lesions uh, is surgical resection. Uh, good news is there's very, very good overall prognosis. Uh, if the lesion itself is uh, deemed non-invasive on pathology, uh, the five-year survival is basically 100%. Uh, and once the lesions are resected, local recurrence is quite rare. Here's case five. It's a patient with abdominal pain. It's a young patient uh, in this case. Uh, and on the top, you have uh, non-contrast CT on your top left. And on the top right, you've got post-contrast CT. Uh, on the bottom left, you've got a coronal post-contrast CT. And it shows a well-circumscribed uh, lesion in the pancreatic head. Uh, if you look on the top left image, you can see a little bit of heterogeneity in the uh, soft tissue lesion, as well as a punctate calcification along the margin. Uh, it is difficult to discern uh, just to the naked eye, whether or not there's actual internal enhancement here. Uh, but there is, uh, you know, there's very low level internal enhancement that was verified with uh, with ROIs within the lesion. Uh, and this is an example of solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, SPN uh, or SPT. 
Uh, this is the daughter lesion in the grandmother, mother, daughter lesion conversation. Uh, these lesions are most commonly seen in young women. The uh, vast majority of lesions are seen in women, 90%, uh, and they're often in their second or third decade of life, uh, unlike the other lesions which you see in older patients. Uh, at the time of diagnosis, the lesions uh, can be quite large. Uh, they're often encapsulated. Uh, here on this slide, on the bottom image here, you see a T2 hypo-intense rim, uh, which is somewhat of a, a, a classic appearance. Uh, you can see hemorrhage within the lesion and calcification within the lesion as well. Now, these lesions have a very, very good prognosis after resection. Uh, for those cases uh, in which the SPN is organ-confined, uh, once it's resected, the tumor is cured in the vast majority of cases, over 95%. Case 6. Uh, this is a patient with no pertinent prior medical history. Uh, there was a focal lesion in the tail of the pancreas seen on a CT obtained for uh, another uh, indication. Uh, here we've got a series of MRI images. On the top left, you have an axial T2. On the top right, you have an MRCP, and on the bottom left, you have a post-contrast image. Uh, and of course, uh, this is an example of an intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, or IPMN. Uh, these are mucin-producing tumors that are contiguous with the ductal system. Uh, they are pre-malignant lesions, but uh, importantly, based off of uh, the type of IPMN that the patients have, your overall chance of developing uh, high-grade uh, malignancy or any sort of high-grade dysplasia uh, differs wildly. Uh, so patients who have main duct IPMN uh, have anywhere from 18 to 60% chance of developing malignant features uh, versus uh, a small minority of side branch IPMNs, usually less than, less than 5%. Uh, now, it's also important to note that IPMN increases overall risk of developing pancreatic cancer anywhere in the pancreas. So you have to be careful not only to scrutinize the lesions themselves, but also to evaluate the pancreatic parenchyma to make sure we're not missing any new solid lesions. Uh, these can be a single or multiple cystic uh, hypodense lesions uh, seen on CT. Uh, however, MRI and MRCP is really the modality of choice. Uh, MRCP imaging is very effective in evaluating uh, IPMNs. And so you can see whether or not uh, these lesions communicate with the main duct. Uh, that is the main differential between this and serious cystadenoma. Remember, serious cystadenoma does not communicate with the main duct. Uh, there are three main types of IPMN. Uh, the most common type, uh, also the uh, type that's least likely to develop uh, worrisome features, is the branch duct IPMN. Uh, and then you have main duct IPMN and mixed type IPMNs. Uh, there are worrisome features that you want to look out for in these lesions, namely the presence of mural nodules uh, and mass-like enhancement within the IPMN, uh, new main ductal dilation, and also just rapid interval growth uh, of the uh, pancreatic cystic lesions. Uh, there's a lot of controversy as, as far as how to manage these appropriately. Uh, I'd refer you to the recent ACR paper describing pancreatic cystic lesions and, and how to manage them uh, for a further review. Again, here's examples of the three main types of IPMNs. We have a side branch IPMN here on the left. You can see the lesion arising from the uh, pancreatic duct right by the ampulla. Uh, we have a mixed type IPMN here in the middle image uh, showing a dilated side branch uh, continuing into a dilated main duct. Uh, and then all the way on the right, you see a classic appearance of a main duct IPMN in which we have diffuse uh, dilation of the entire main pancreatic duct. A couple of important tips uh, to remember with these lesions. Uh, you always want to make sure that the greatest length of the branch duct IPMN is measured in long axis on axial or coronal images. Uh, oftentimes, wrong measurements can be propagated across multiple follow-up studies. This is an, an example here. Uh, we've got uh, a lesion that measures 17 millimeters on the axial T2 image, but in reality, on the coronal MRCP, this lesion measures 28 millimeters. So make sure you check all planes just to make sure that the longest uh, diameter is in fact the one that's being measured. Branch duct IPMNs confer uh, 
an overall greater than 20% increased risk of developing malignancy if they're growing at more than 5 millimeters per year. Basically, any main ductal dilation in the setting of a, a branch duct IPMN is alarming. Here's an example case. We've got a patient who's been followed for many years for this pancreatic body IPMN. Uh, in May 2014, uh, greater than one year later, in October 2015, the patient comes back, and here, obviously, on the MRCP from the follow-up study, you can see that there is new ductal dilation, really up to the level of the IPMN itself. Uh, this lesion was resected and returned uh, high-grade dysplasia. As usual, don't forget the rest of the pancreas when evaluating IPMNs. This is an example case of a patient you see with new diffuse pancreatic ductal dilation uh, in 2018 on the follow-up study compared to the prior study from October 2017. So interestingly, when you look in October 2018, there's a large hypo-enhancing mass in the region of the pancreatic head consistent with known adenocarcinoma. The important thing to note was on the prior study from October 2017, that tumor was there, but it was not picked up uh, because you know, possibly because people were focused on the cystic lesions. So it's very important, again, to really scrutinize not only the cystic lesions, but the rest of the pancreatic parenchyma when evaluating for IPM and follow-up. Okay, here we have tricky case one, a patient with weight loss. Uh, mostly MRI images here. On the top left, you've got coronal T2 images showing a foci of T2 hypointense signal here in the pancreatic head and unsinate process. Uh, those lesions do demonstrate focal diffusion uh, on the DWI and ADC images. They're hypo-enhancing here on the post-contrast image on your bottom left. And on the MRCP image, you see that there appears to be sort of a, a disappearance of the main pancreatic duct traversing the uh, one of the uh, T2 hypo-intense lesions. Although upstream, you don't see that the tumor is... Uh, that you don't see that the main duct is quite that dilated. And so you may be inclined to uh, say this is an adenocarcinoma based off of the fact that it's hypo-enhancing and you've got uh, diffusion restriction here. But uh, you really want to make note, there were two separate lesions seen on the T2-weighted image here, one here in the unsinate process and another separate lesion here in the uh, pancreatic head and body. And there's also not a great degree of upstream ductal dilation. And so... This is actually a case of autoimmune pancreatitis. Uh, now, autoimmune pancreatitis is a rare form of chronic pancreatitis. It's seen in 5 to 11% of cases, uh, and it can involve biliary tree, kidneys, uh, the aorta, in the setting of retroperitoneal fibrosis, uh, as well as lymph nodes. Uh, it's part of the constellation of IgG4 uh, disease findings that you can see in multiple systems. Now, importantly, you will learn autoimmune pancreatitis is classically seen as a sausage-shaped and featureless uh, pancreatic parenchyma with T2 hypo-intense rind, uh, but you have to note that it can not only be, can it be diffuse, but it can also be focal autoimmune pancreatitis, which is what the uh, tricky case was in this, ca uh, in this uh, example. Uh, there's also a diffusely narrowed main pancreatic duct uh, traversing the uh, inflammatory process, there is something called the duct penetrating sign, uh, which if you can actually see the duct traversing the lesion, the odds are it's an infectious or an inflammatory cause as opposed to a neoplastic cause. Um, so those are just a few of the uh, findings you want to keep your eyes out for. Here again is tricky case uh, number two. We've got an incidental lesion here in the pancreatic tail. So on the T1-weighted image uh, on the top left, you do see a well-circumscribed, somewhat hypo-intense uh, round lesion here in the pancreatic tail in comparison to the pancreatic parenchyma. It's got uh, T2 hypo-intense appearance. It's got a bit of internal enhancement, and it also has um, diffusion uh, signal in it. Uh, and so uh, some may uh, think or mistake this for a neuroendocrine tumor because it's got uh, early arterial enhancement, and it's got diffusion restriction. Uh, but make note of the signal of this lesion in conjunction, not just with the pancreas, but the adjacent organs uh, in the left upper abdomen. Uh, and this is a classic example of an intrapancreatic splenule. Uh, this is most commonly seen in the pancreatic tail. Uh, a lot of patients actually uh, were seen to have intrapancreatic splenules on autopsy. 
on an autopsy series around 17%. Now, the important thing to make the diagnosis of intrapancreatic splenule, the lesion must follow the appearance of the spleen on every single imaging sequence. If it doesn't follow the spleen on just one single imaging sequence on an MRI, you cannot call it an intrapancreatic splenule. Uh, there are a couple of nuclear medicine studies that uh, you can order in order to uh, verify or to confirm this diagnosis, namely the technetium-99 labeled RBC study and the technetium-99 sulfur colloid scan. So to sum up, we've gone over a number of different lesions. Uh, the most common tumor, primary tumor in the pancreas is the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. We have a number of resources available that describes the important concepts and how to evaluate and report those lesions. Uh, we also discussed uh, neuroendocrine tumor, serous cyst adenoma, mucinous cystic neoplasm, solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasm, and a couple of tricky cases, which in uh, this, this lecture were focal autoimmune pancreatitis and intrapancreatic splenule. Here are a couple of very useful resources uh, for uh, your enjoyment. And thank you very much.